Hi, I want to all welcome you to Minehurst University's live web presentation featuring Dr. Gutsy Green from the University of Vermont. She will be discussing reducing risks on the horse farm. Dr. Green is an Associate Professor of Animal Science and Extension Equine Specialist in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at the University of Vermont. She was raised in Bedford, Massachusetts, and received her AAS and BS from Moorhead State University, her MS from the University of Arizona, and her PhD from Kansas State University. She earned American Registry of Professional Animal Scientist Certification in 1997. Let's welcome Betsy, and um, we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. I'll look for a... Okay, let's try this. Uh, sound right now, I think? Somebody type in and tell me that it's good, bad, or I need to make some changes. Yes, all right. Okay, super, much better. <laughs> okay, so tonight, I'll click this slide forward. We we're talking about reducing risks on the horse farm. And um, glad to see, wow, we have Saudi Arabia, Germany, Idaho, Utah, we've got folks from all over the place. Uh, welcome. I'm in Vermont, and it was a nice balmy, oh, 50, 45 or 50 degrees, which is, of course, short sleeve weather for us at this time of year. But most folks can actually think about some time in their life, if they've worked with horses, when they, whether they were in a leadership role, whether they were in a student, a child at the barn, you name it. They can think of some time when at one point or another they looked around and said, oh boy, I could have seen that coming. I was just waiting for that to happen. So now when we're looking at the position of being in charge or being liable or having the safety of your clientele at hand, Certainly we want to take those things that we could have seen coming and do something to prevent them. So as we go through here, we'll look at a few different things. The first thing we'll look at about, talk about is the facilities. That's safety for the human, the animal, the environment. Also, the behavior factor. Not to say that people would ever behave badly, correct? Everybody's seen some situations in that case. And then just finish up with a little bit of healthy horse and some recent issues that have been going on. And we're not going to cover everything, but it'll give you a lot to think about as you go back to your own facility in whatever role you play in that facility. So even if you're a boarder, you can look around your facility and say, okay, gosh, we should make some changes because it could be a change in the facility or it could be a change in behavior or just avoidance. So for example, if you have a really dangerous area, the place that's always wet in the, in the cross ties, <clears throat> and you know that it's just some time until some horse starts slipping or whatever the case, well, if you can't change a facility, then you darn well better not have clientele or kids or someone that isn't responsible for their own welfare in that situation. So just food for thought on that, and we'll do a little bit of testing as well as we go through. So be paying attention. All right, so even just things in the overall design, and we'll get down to the some of the more direct things as well. Think about the facilities that you've worked and ridden in. When you go to take the horse or the group of young beginners leading, you know, the little kids that are about as high as the horse's knee, leading Big Jubal and Rebel and all those guys out to the arena, do they have to cross where the traffic comes through to get to that arena? You know, that right there is a heads up that's an accident waiting to happen. Now, a couple of things on that. First of all, because those students are not in control. You know, they may think they are, but something can go wrong, whether it's a truck that comes roaring in or whatever. All of, everything can go to hell in a handbasket in two seconds. And so if you have something like that, you need to make a change immediately because that's something that you know about 
and you can see, you can foresee. And so if you have that and something happens and somebody said, well, yeah, that's we've had several near misses. Oh boy, you might be in a little bit of trouble if somebody seriously hurt. So think about that kind of stuff. Are all of your barn needs met? Do you have adequate places to safely handle or tack up all of the horses for a lesson at one time or groom all the horses or whatever the case or keep the horses in or outside however you do so then another one of those things often we're stuck with whatever barn we get because you go out and you say gosh i'd love to build this beautiful barn and we'll see one here in the next slide or so but most of us don't have that luxury so is the design appropriate for the weather conditions in your area well let's just see if that's true in the next slide okay in your upper center that was last year right about this time University of Vermont farm if you look at the upper left picture of that or portion of that top picture you can see a coverall type barn these are actually calf barns at the university farm and so we'll pick on some of these university facilities both ours and previous ones from previous lives or where I visited as we go through some of this but that was uh, shall we say a little too heavy snow load for that calf barn no calves were hurt no humans were hurt but it was a total loss now should that have been managed when there was that much snow coming coming down perhaps Hindsight's 2020. Now, one of the people that helped rescue the little calves, and they were the little first newborns that were in their little calf blankets and everything else, was a faculty member that now is at University of California in Davis. Lower left is his, <laughs> his barn, or his partner's barn, where she keeps the horses on their rental property. And that's from about two weeks ago. So we basically have decided that they are the problem. They have caused these barn roofs to come off or barns to collapse. They're the ones that are the jinx. So hopefully the rest of our University of Vermont barns will be safe now that they're over in, at UC Davis. But anyway, that was a windstorm in the lower left. Took off the roof and they had just had some work done to further tap down those uh, tin sheets so it doesn't always work and sometimes you just makes you want to cry <laughs> sometimes you just have to deal with it so this is a, a friend of mine who has numerous embarrassing pictures of her young four-year-old and this was in the in in the uh, Halloween costume era era where I want to be a cowboy but I can't wear my hat if I sit on it, so I'm going to cry. <laughs> so, but you know, we've all felt this way at one time or another. All right, so some general concepts for inside the barn. You definitely want to make sure you have good ventilation. That is going to be key for the health of you and your horses. And, you know, usually we're thinking of the horses first, you know, whatever we can do to help these horses. Okay. Now, picture you have in front of you is the UVM Morgan Horse Farm. That barn is a beautiful, beautiful barn. I actually took that picture a couple of years ago, and you can see it was during fall foliage, and it was a dark and stormy day. <laughs> but it was actually a really cool picture. That barn is built, oh, it's been built over 100 years ago, and there are stalls up on that top level there, there's a nice big hay loft, or as they call it here, a hay mow. I'm sure some of you guys have heard that. Oh, we have a Morgan fan, Michelle, we, <laughs> chiming in on the chat. But um, I'm going to show you down. I want you to look on the far, let's see, I think I actually have an arrow here. I'm going to see if I can actually put that pointer. Uh, here's my pointer. So you see down here that where that red arrow is, that actually falls off down below there, and there's a second floor down, or a basement, in essence, down below. So, we will show you, I'm going to get rid of that pointer. 
<clears throat> as far as ventilation, the key three things that you want. You want air to come in, you want air to go out, and then in that process you want minimal drafts. So you don't want to have your barn in a situation where it's basically a wind tunnel and I've, I've been in those, you know, you build on top of the hill and great ventilation except you're getting blown off your horse while you're trying to ride in the area. That That's not going to be real comfortable. So air in, air out, minimal drafts. And in that situation, to have these the good ventilation, you want to use windows that, number one, your horse can't get to and or break because you know that if a horse can get to it, it will. If it can break it, it will. And it will probably eat the glass and then colic surgery, you name it. We've had uh, horses, I grew up in Massachusetts, as you heard, and it was a old cattle barn that was really old, as in like 1700s, that was converted to a horse barn. So it was low ceilings and we had the little uh, light bulb covers over the low light bulbs on those low ceilings and we they kind of went a little bit cheap on some of them because you know it's a high cost trying to get all this stuff taken care of well there was one palomino mare that you could not kill i i don't care what she her owners loved her dearly she was a boarder she ate the metal casing off the light bulb and ate the light bulb now, how do I know she ate the light bulb? Because I cleaned her stall. Then I found the little filament and the screw-in part encased in her manure. And so, note to self, heavy light bulb covers, if they are within access, the heavy, heavy duty ones rather than the thin wire ones that look like they're helping. Um, well, this, uh, this mare also had a, eaten a glove and how do you know because it was full of manure came out in the pile full of manure so no matter what some horses they can you can look at them wrong and they find some way to hurt themselves or be ill this mare you couldn't have killed her with a shotgun i don't think it's a good thing her owners loved her <laughs> but she was rather destructive around the barn so anyway and she if she had had windows she definitely Oh, somebody, Michelle could find, stopped her Morgan from eating the light bulb. Well, she did this, her, this in the dark of night. But um, had she had a window near, in, within her reach, she probably would have eaten the casing and everything else too. And so, anyway, another thing that I've seen actually with windows, we've had folks that built and they wanted natural light. And that's really good. You know, use natural light, save power, save energy, especially in the costs that we have coming out today. But if you have like a panel that allows natural light and you have a lot of sunshine, you can actually have a huge hot spot in your stall and just make it miserable. That natural light becomes like the the magnifying glass on the on the bug of the evil, you know, in the hands of the evil child. So make sure that that natural light goes to the alleyway rather than, or the aisleway rather than over the horse directly, or have it from a side panel rather than straight over as a sunlight. So another thing to think about for making air move, exhaust fans like up in the peak area on either end of your barn will help move air without actually putting too much of a a um, draft on your horses. Now <clears throat> I showed you that arrow on the barn. This is the lower level of the UVM Morgan horse farm. Somebody type in, see who can get to the, the fastest. How can you tell if you have bad ventilation? <laughs> There we go. Moisture. Okay. Oh, somebody typed it in. <laughs> I want the answer. Dust. Moisture. What else? Air quality. How do you know if it's good or bad? Wet floors. Okay. Condensation. Moisture. Yeah. Mold. Odor. Okay. So our 
How many of you have walked in the barn and the nice, you know, sweating horses, yep, nice end of the, you know, winter, cold, cold morning, walk in the barn, taking a deep breath, and what do you smell? Ammonia, absolutely. And, and yes, then people cough as well. So if you have dust, mold, nice, warm, toasty barn, then you're holding all of that air in. And you don't think about it so much, but the horse actually is more comfortable in a less toasty barn. Usually we have the barn toasty for our comfort. So you can imagine this these barn, you'll see other pictures of this barn throughout some of the presentation. But um, yeah, the ventilation is not all that great downstairs here. And you can see it has to be <laughs> Uh, artificially lit because it is the basement. Okay, so this is the actual old horse barn up on UVM campus. And so it was built in the 60s and is not used anymore. The folks that are in there, we were doing a barn safety analysis workshop. I said, okay, act natural. So of course they pointed to this hook that a horse could catch itself on and hammed it up. You'll see a few other hammed up pictures in the future. Now, notice that there's no there's no air space above. It's a, it's basically a low ceiling. When you walk into that barn, and again, it's an old barn. If you have any kind of allergies, you will take a nice deep breath and then <coughs> cough because there's not good air movement. <coughs> no, I'll cough, um, and it's just not good ventilation, and so. It's, it's got a moldy, musty smell, and right now that barn is not being used. It has other structural issues as well. We'll show you some of the other facilities. Now, several of you are probably looking at that barn saying, boy, I wish mine was that nice, and that's true. So there are a lot worse, but talking about ventilation, and this is not a good facility. All right, how about some other things? In the upper left-hand corner, you see Moorhead State University in Moorhead, Kentucky. And that is the, quote, show barn. And you can see the, it's that's a nice long shed row. It has stalls on both sides. And you can see there's hay storage above those stalls. But um, one thing I can tell you, the ceilings in the stalls are higher. The rafters in the loft are lower. And so you had to actually get into your, what I called the field hockey stance when you went through, because there are hay holes right over the hay racks in the stalls, and you had to be squatted low and moving, and I can't tell you how many times I clocked my head on those rafters there. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so not as good a ventilation as if it was open over the stalls, but there are bars on the front of those stalls, so there is some air movement allowed in there. And down lower left, you see perfect ventilation. That's at Washington State University, and the, that's Charlie standing in the feeder. They had shelter and you know, paddock. It was fine for them. They got fuzzy in the winter, and they had very few health problems and very few respiratory issues. On the right, you actually do see Seattle Slough, and he's no longer with us, but he was at Three Chimneys Farm at the time I took this picture. If you look real close, you can see he's sticking his tongue out at you. And this was, <coughs> excuse me, a stallion barn, and there were four stalls in this barn. And, you know, this is ideal. Probably not what most of us have as far as facilities. All right, flooring. You can find good, bad, and ugly for every type of flooring in the facility. You can find concrete and asphalt, and they're not so great drainage, but they are definitely, um, can be slippery, but they do hold up. Clay, which we have a lot of here, is very slippery when wet. Dirt, if you have a horse that loves to paw at the door for feed time, then you'll know that you can get some really good exercise filling in his holes. Okay? And stone dust or gravel or 
semi-pack or sure pack there's all different terms for this that is often a pretty reasonable footing in the stall you end up having to put it in and you end up having to repair it over time depending on the horse's behavior in the stall but that's something that has some drainage and also provides support and of course most of the time you're talking about having at least shavings or straw or some other sort of bedding on there if you have concrete or asphalt often those are covered with rubber mats or some sort of stall mattresses and or deep bedding so the one thing you want to think about is having a floor that is skid proof yet cleanable okay now human created hazards this is the equine facility on campus at the university of vermont with our ham people on the left and right there or on the left picture and you can see on the right side of the stalls in that left picture it's open over the stalls on the left side you can see that there is a little gate or fence there and that is actually it has a hayloft a small hayloft over so we do have a mix of that it's an H shaped barn and ventilation is much better than on the on the other barn that you saw the one that we used they used to use and as far as human created hazards I want you to take a look at the right picture and so there's some students getting ready to drive a horse getting the that's actually a little Morgan that was a, owned by a student from a few years ago you see they painted up the feet and they're <clears throat> got just getting ready now can anyone type in the difference between the mats on the right picture and the mats on the left picture near 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 what's the difference okay there's 52 of you here <laughs> one is upside down nope oh, mats are all where they are that's where the cross ties are okay permanent versus temporary both of those are temporary those are just the two different aisles solid mats on the right so water doesn't drain that's true they're both solid uh, left looks slippery one's dirty and one isn't yeah <clears throat> yeah okay both sides are rubber those are the exact same mats they're both level with the ground the thing is that somebody the work study or the barn student has cleaned up the one in the left picture and watered down the alleyway so that it wouldn't be dusty problem is they watered down the mats a little bit too much and in fact those mats are pretty slippery and could be a hazard right now so sometimes it's a matter of human created hazards when you're looking at these different situations all right so okay my animation didn't work so you guys get the secret right out there this is a picture of our star our feed room and you can see each set of the two little um, trolleys in there have individual feeds for each of the horses we have morning feed and night feed <clears throat> and this is a student run barn uh, horse barn cooperative and I wandered in to take some of these pictures and this is a while ago and it's you know definitely say okay you gotta have your hay and your feed separated from the horse because you know the horse can get into the feed room can colic can founder the whole nine yards well this is how the door was when I got there so here we have it all separate but the fact is if they don't leave the door closed then you still have the same issues if you had it out there saying come get me so food for thought that's the behavior if the behavior is not right then you haven't protected yourself for your horse all right here's another question looks like my technology will work here okay get your typing fingers ready what can you see is wrong with this picture in this case we have a UVM student with her own horse she's since graduated and it's at night as you can see out the door she's getting ready to ride her horse okay so that's fine okay not safety ties all right so cross ties are 
door too close to the cross ties cross ties are too long no breakaway cross ties are not on the side of the halter actually I think they are on the side of the halter gaps in the mats cross ties are not on the side of the halter horse is standing in front of a door that might open behind her blankets left on the ground that messy messy student okay some good points now this is the behavior factor there are safety clips or on the wall side of the cross ties cross ties are inherently dangerous okay if you choose to use them you need to be safe as safe as you can and that you know that's a personal choice knowing that there is inherent danger because whenever you're training a horse to be on cross ties there will be uh, shall we say learning lessons yeah so Kelly says the horse is not standing on the mats but on the asphalt so and somebody else said the horse is standing too close to the door you're both right she's not using the equipment correctly she oh somebody's already getting after her belly her tap attack <laughs> okay her girth is not hooked up so I think when she hooks up that girth that that martingale will tighten right up so yeah she's not using that correctly she should have her horse turned around facing that door so it's standing on those mats she should probably have her blanket up there she should <clears throat> not have that horse that close to the door because if you look on the right side of that door it's actually locked so nobody will be opening it but the fact that little green hint hook there does lock it and it's at night so nobody will open that door but the fact is I have a friend of mine who has a Morton type building like this she had a mare that was standing outside in her paddock just outside the barn door and I don't know a fly came along or something she kicked at it she kicked through that tin panel and she sliced tendons so that horse should not be facing that direction should be on the mats and that's all behavior oops gotta click on here what are these mats for anyway okay so even when you set things up so that there's safety intended or planned for you got to make sure it's used appropriately all right I think there's about 10 things I did not set this picture up this is at a university farm not ours I'll even tell you it was at Cornell you know you New Yorkers on there Cornell we hold you up to high standards this is a non-planned picture start typing guys tell me 10 things that you can find those cords are dangerous dangerous wiring absolutely oh my <laughs> rat's nest of electrical wires holy smokes I gotta scroll up to see what you guys are saying here okay loose fan overload fans not secured uh, <laughs> call the fire department quick that box fan could tip over no words dust could be a fire hazard too much in the surge strip the horse can reach it all now you guys can't really see but there is actually a horse in that stall and you are absolutely right that horse could reach it all <laughs> yes there is I'm promising you Jennifer there's a horse in that stall and yes yeah, too much dust near the wires uh, I think I, I think you guys got most of it and that is a real situation okay in a real barn and probably several of you guys can relate to something maybe not quite so bad so it looks like you guys have a good start on recognizing issues <laughs> yeah definitely that horse it, it is truly Cornell and um, it was one of those student barns where they could board their horses yes the horse could actually reach out and electrocute and I you know you can go to any barn you can find all kinds of issues yeah even <laughs> so even Cornell has some dull moments or D moments <laughs> so yeah and there so there's lots and lots of things that you could do you guys are right on top of that all right now how many of you folks have ever seen that barn where you have to walk your horse in and out like a little uh, 
kind of like an obstacle course to get between all the tack boxes that are outside the stalls. That is an accident waiting to happen because usually you have sharp corners as well. So you never can have a tack room that's too large because you want clean, clear aisles. You want clean, clear work area and certainly a clean, clear wash rack. So just giving you, and I'll show you a really good one here in, the, in a second. How about that for a clean, clear area? That again is the Morgan Horse Farm. I'm going to get my little button on here. <clears throat> All right, come here, little button. Now, this is where they actually cross tie, tack up, shave, clip, vacuum, prep for driving. You can see on the wall they do a lot of driving and long lining and lunging. It's about 90 horses in that facility right at the facility right now. One thing I want you to look at, you see this arrow where I have that red arrow? There's a horse in that little tiny door. All right, I'll move it over here. There's a horse in that little tiny door. That's uh, not as tiny. And there's a horse back on the left here. There's another door. So there's three stalls that are right off this very cluttered wash rack. Now, if this were a public area and you had a beginner person in there and the horse got a little bit agitated or this this guy back in here started pitching a fit and kicking the stall and spooking the horse, Achi mama, you can just <laughs> you can just say uh, see the accident waiting to happen. That blue thing that we're taught that somebody asked about, that's the hose to the vacuum. This is a vacuum. Uh, take my arrow over here. That's a big standing vacuum. And that's what you're talking about. Okay, yes. So it is, of course, convenient as long as nothing goes wrong. And uh, for strange horses, or in your case, if there's somebody that um, is a client, then you're putting them at a known risk. Okay, and yeah, it is a fire hazard to get out all, all of those horses safely. So some good points by our chatters as well. Now, some common problems. Get rid of that little arrow. We have only people, when they actually can plan their building, they only do it for current needs. They don't look at growth. They often don't look at storage or water, or electricity, utility rooms, locations. Often don't plan for adequate manure storage. And many times they underestimate the empty storage space needed. So whether that's hay, shavings, manure, tack, or tools. And one of the things that we had, the I told you we had the H bar and you saw the wet floor versus the knot. Well, in that H part of it, the cross piece, there is a wash rack and there's a room I'll show you in a minute. It has our fire suppression system in it. And we had all of our wheelbarrows and everything else. So you know, you walk up, put it up to the wall and flip the handles up. All of those were right across from the wash rack, and there would be horses coming by there with that, wheelbarrows and trash cans and everything else, all the equipment hanging on. And of course, in Vermont, we do tend to have lots and lots of blankets on these, especially the student horses. So it was an accident waiting to happen. We had a, we did convert one of the stalls to a tool stall, and it cleaned everything up made everything much more controlled and decreased a high potential for an accident. All right, ventilation, water heaters, sprinkler systems. You're going to have some different situations, a lot more if you're at a university, I guess unless you're in that back barn at Cornell, than you would necessarily have at a public place. We have all kinds of requirements that we have to live up to beyond what the OSHA or typical requirements that the an equine business would have <clears throat> and but you also need to know silly things like what your water sources are if you do have a fire does it come from a well does it come from a from town water you better know these things ahead of time now I'm sure if you look at this this is our fire suppression system so on the right side here lower right, all of that, 
Uh, I'll give you a website to find some of those requirements. Yeah, everybody has one of these in their barn, right? Okay, so this is in the building or in the a room next to our wash rack in the H part. You can see the lower left picture, there's water, the sprinkler system there going above the, right below the hayloft OSHA special fencing so that we don't fall out of the loft. You can see the little bell in the upper left hand corner that rings so the horses will know there's a fire if the uh, fire suppression system is tri triggered. So. The University of Vermont, we didn't have that in the old barn. We certainly do in the new barn. And now, I want you to look at this. I'm going to back up. If you look at the um, lower left, if you were to follow that, that um, I'm sorry, lower right-hand corner, follow that wall back to the other corner, this is what you see. Right there is what you see. This is the water heater. And we almost had a fire in our room that has our fire suppression system. Why? Because we didn't have adequate ventilation. Yeah, it was certainly melting. There is now adequate ventilation. So, uh, I'm not sure about the standpipe. And... I don't know that OSHA actually requires fire horses to practice the drill. <laughs> but So here we have the best and brightest and most expensive system you could ever have, and we almost burned up the barn in the same exact room. Hmm. So, planning. So another thing to think about, these are as is. You can see that we have the... Uh, boxes on the right hand side that's in that same room and so you need to know where these things are located you can see the fire extinguishers that says keep clear keep clear and you can't see the second one because it's or on the one on the left because it's blocked by the trash can that's blocking it <laughs> so huh again even how regardless of how you plan things you still have issues so, what you need to have by the phone, how to call, who to call, you think 911, well, where does that go to? Okay, so you need for people information, you need the police, the local, the, in our case, the campus, and then all the student, -ish, student numbers on the right, the veterinarians, all that stuff available by the phone. Okay, you also want accessible horse and human records. If somebody was hurt very seriously and they needed, they were unconscious, you better have uh, medical information so that you can at least hand it off to the ambulance folks, the EMTs or whatever, because they can't necessarily treat or they might treat something you know, with something that they that could harm that person, and if they have medical records, you can find that out ahead of time, so that they can do the best to treat that person. Okay, another one of those silly little things. You say, okay, well, you should have directions to the facility, and from a certain point. You say, yeah, but I know how to tell them. Well, number one, it might be you that's unconscious. Number two, it might be that. Whoever is in the situation is panicked, and we're not always thinking 100% when we're panicked. So it's much better to have the farm is located at the Route 20 and Route 80 cutoff, and it's two miles down on the left from such and such, whatever. Give those so that anybody, if a stranger came out in from the, you know, saw something happen and came in to try and help, they could call the ambulance, police, whatever, and tell how to get there. So it's not always you that's calling. Don't don't assume that, oh, well, I'll be calm under pressure and all that. You might be the one that's unconscious. Horse and human first aid kits, certainly some of them, sometimes there are uh, interchangeable pieces in those. But, um, and you can see we have a little bit of both down there. We have the horse first aid kit down in the right picture. <clears throat> the human one is on the wall. 
So, yes, and it's also good, somebody made the point uh, to work with the fire or police department to pre-plan the facility. When we had a um, rodeo up at Washington State University farm, horse farm, one of the bronc riders got bucked off, broke his leg. Okay, so the ambulance needed to take care of him and respond. Problem was, as we're waiting for the ambulance, the people had taken, dro driven too far and they were up in the apartments above the facility. So definitely make sure pre-planning is excellent. And uh, the other thing is if you have multiple barns on your facilities, you had better have some sort of labeling because again, you might know where everything is, but that doesn't mean that you will be the one trying to direct somebody to the injured party. All right, so safe environment, of course, it's outside and inside, free of nails, barbed wire, broken fences, glass windows, poison, you name it. Here's some facilities, and the upper left is in Kentucky at a thoroughbred breeding farm. There are no shelters there because those horses would not be left out overnight. They're worth too much. On the upper right, you see a shelter that's being used by, I think it was Hippology students, to plan their presentation at Washington State University. And this was actually one, an extra one at the time. But these actually work quite well for the horses, and they were quite happy. Down lower left, you see a, a little shelter that has, that's in England. And then in the lower right, I believe that was in Las Vegas area when we went to pick up some horses. And that's their stall shelter on dirt. So it depends on your geographical uh, weather, you name it, as to what's appropriate. Okay, so this is Cornell. And you see the, you recognize the picture in the lower left. And you see across the hall from that stall is the picture that you see in the lower right. What's going on in that picture? Any issues there? Type away, folks. Do, 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 do. Who's going to help us out here? Oh, come on. You guys are still awake, aren't you? Here we go. Always not too clear. Hoses laying out, clutter, extension cords, wheelbarrows, exposed hay. It's not working. Unprotected hay, carts against the wall, clutter, dust. Absolutely. And there was actually a horse. Yeah, lots of stuff. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> okay, yeah. So if a horse gets loose, if he doesn't cut himself on those tack trunks uh, and go in and eat that easily accessible feed, I don't know who was supposed to be supervising the students. Mark, it wasn't me. <laughs> I was just a, a visitor, and I always tend to try and take pictures of the facilities. Okay. So, yeah, all of these things that you've mentioned, um, and there was actually a horse that was just kind of standing there without having the, the door, you know, the, uh, I think it was even just a rope across. So they must be amazing, perfect horses. <laughs> Absolutely. And somebody mentioned outside danger, gooseneck trailer hitches and having a mare run into one. Yes, that certainly can be an issue, too. So now you can see that they were doing some fencing in the upper left. And you can imagine that there were a few nails in, the, in those boards there. Now you can see the upper right, there's a yellow wire going across the top. That's a hot wire to keep them from chewing the fence. And I'll show you a little closer picture of that um, in a minute so you can tell me what else is going on. All right, so of course pasture for horses, high quality, properly fenced, properly maintained. It can be a low cost feed source and a natural environment for your horse. Everybody has pasture like this, right? Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> and this is in Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, I do wish to. And you can see even in that perfect, uh, perfect pasture, there's clover on the far end, those trees that you see, there's some cherry trees in there that are not 
there anymore because of the caterpillar issues a few years ago. So these are this is from prior to the caterpillar issues with the mare reproductive loss and system uh, syndrome. Sorry, yeah, Planet Kentucky. I like that. <laughs> Uh, yes, and cherry is bad for hor for horses as well. Now, more often we are put to dealt with poor pasture, and it serves more as an exercise area than a feed source. Can have a high uh, potential for parasites, mud problems, and also environmental problems. <clears throat> this look a little closer to familiar to some of you guys. Uh, upper left is a, an old quarter horse stallion. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> And <laughs> that's more like it. Yes, mud can truly suck your boots off. I can tell you that. <laughs> and uh, that that is just a turnout paddock. The one in the upper right is also at Con Moorhead State and turnout paddock. There are fields that are in better shape beyond that. The lower center one is our gate area at our University of Vermont new quote paddocks so now what's wrong with this guy this is back to Cornell any problems with that aye, 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 I like that <laughs> so again we go to electrical issues when you have a an extension cord and the horse oh and the hose yep there could be a horse in this paddock next to it too many problems so Right there, that should be a heads up. If there's anything that the horse can reach or get hung up on or bite, the fencing is actually okay. Now, one thing you'll notice is that the posts are on the inside. And if a horse gets to running across, yeah, fences, the fencing's on backwards. That's what somebody said down there. Horse goes running along that fence line. There have been horses that have taken out a shoulder when they've got run into the posts. So generally, you want the post on the away from the horses. All right, so here we have it with the posts are away from the horses. Now tell me what's going on. Yeah, round is better, and we can have all kinds of different views on fencing, and sometimes it's a matter what you can get as well. There's a key thing here. So you guys notice that black... Um, <laughs> That black tubing that goes to the water pen or the water um, jug out there is for turning on and filling up the water. My little Jack Russell's barking at somebody here in the background. So you notice that they have a water heater in that water tub. How do you know? Yeah, that is truly an extension cord wrapped around the fence within the horse's chewing area. And, you know, there's not a whole ton of stuff to eat in that pasture. So, uh, they could potentially put it underground. <laughs> but I'm just telling you that sometimes, and, yeah, I, I know some horses that would be fried as well. Probably not that Palomino. <laughs> but you can go to any facility and you can find things wrong. So, the key is how can you make some changes. All right. So, now we have, we had... Um, Oh, what do we call it? The conduit that we put the electrical cords in for the water heaters in Washington State water tubs. And yeah, conduit, except for we had a colt that, of course, would be yanking that water heater that was firmly secured and yank it off of its, um, its stand that the folks at the physicals plant made. So. Anyway, just giving you a little bit. So think about things for responsibility to your horses, your neighbors, the environment, and your clients. And that's to keep as everything and everybody safe. Just showing you an example at our university farm, we had some issues. The beautiful barn, that's the back side of the arena. You can see on the right, <coughs> excuse me, we have white tape fences. So. Here's a lovely young lady, Hillary, leading the horse down to the gate. Okay, nice, happy, happy, three-strand hot wire or hot white tape fence. Then you look at the gate. The way the paddocks were built, they were built to make it convenient for us. And the paddocks run north to south, and the gates are at the south end. 
So even when we have some nice compacted ground in that area and weeds and grass and clover and all that, we still have standing water. Now then you start getting to the mud, you start getting to the winter, and you can imagine it's a nice ice rink and it could go deep. Yeah, I hope she has boots. We've we've lost some boots and shoes in that area. The other problem was that once they got into the mud pocking with their hooves, then it'd freeze and then we'd have abscess issues because they'd stand on the frozen hoof part, uh, pro frozen hoof prints. So we had issues. Oh. <laughs> Greta's saying hi to all you guys. So what we did, we didn't do a sacrifice area, but we tried to improve. <laughs> and somebody says hi to you, Greta. Yes, here, have a cookie. <laughs> so um, we, <coughs> excuse me, we took out some of the topsoil. We put down filter fabric or geotextile fabric. We put down a layer of big stone, another sandwiching layer of the textile fabric. We said, okay, this is already compact ground. We're not going to ever grow anything on it, so let's improve the drainage. Okay, and then we put a pipe from the lowest side down across that travel lane so it gr dra drained down to the green grass buffer below. So that was improving the situation. And now if you look down there, those top two paddocks are not done. This time we're looking towards the back. That's the indoor arena on your right side. And you can see most of the horses are hanging out on the paddocks that we did with that filter fabric. And in fact, all of them are done now. Yeah, and it does provide dry ground for them. And it's wide enough so you can bring the horse in, turn them around, and not be knee deep. So as far as preventing an accident because I see that we're getting moving along here so I just want to make sure we get there. Provide the safe environment. You know that there's typical accidents waiting to happen in your tie areas and slick surfaces in the aisle in a situation where there's a lack of supervision or in a lack of instructor experience. And I was one of these too. I got down to the barn and like, oh, okay, you're doing okay. Why don't you take out these beginners? Because, you know, I probably was an advanced beginner rider and, and under 18 and back in the day. So we have our least experienced instructors teaching the beginner riders. So those are types of things that are sometimes more likely to see problems. And that can actually be uh, something that we can control. So you all know the eye high, arm's length, adequate distance between the horses, proper locations, narrow aisles can be a great hazard, especially if you have too many horses trying to pass underneath the cross ties or tied to a wall too close together. Uh, absolutely beginner lessons or private lessons are great. Okay. <clears throat> So again, we talked at the very beginning, the distance between the barn and the arena. Anytime you have beginners, horses, footing, traffic, you can have issues. And a lot of these can be avoidable. In the riding era, whether it's surface issues, distractions, hooks, posts on the inside of the fence, high tensile wire, wire fencing. Folks, Some folks believe in this and love it. and as long as it's done properly. I've also had somebody that had a horse look like it went through a cheese slicer when it would not stop regardless of of the properly installed and electrified fence. <clears throat> okay, gates can be a wreck waiting to happen. If you have to lift, pivot, go through mud and keep the horse handled and keep the other horses from coming out while you do the kick, kick lift twist to get the gate open, probably time to rehang that gate. Now, as far as what we can control, it's certainly not the beginning rider because they are inexperienced, unpredictable. And horse, <laughs> that's questionable whether we can control them. But the riding area, we can control size, type, footing, fencing, and appropriate mounts for horse and rider. So. 
If you're the one that's in charge, you have to make sure that when there's something that you think it just ain't right, that's what the Kentucky version of something ain't right, then, and I went to school in Kentucky, so <laughs> I learned that. <clears throat> Whether it's weather, upset riders or horses, sore, lame or sick horses, faulty or worn equipment, just make a change when it's something in your gut, listen to that gut and either say, you know, let's do something on the ground today or let's just whatever the case, okay? Because after the accident is too late. And of course, we are always looking to say, oh, we must save the horse or save the dog or whatever. But first things first, people first, horses second, everything else after that. And that is your key, okay? And so when people want to really jump in to save the horse, but they put themselves in danger or per peril, then that's not going to be so great. What about that horse? has a dangerous propensity. You as the owner might be liable if he or she knew or should have known that that horse has done this before. So if you knew or should have known and you failed to make reasonable or necessary care to prevent injuries caused by the horse, you could be liable. And of course, what is the ten a propensity? A tendency to engage in unusual behavior. So spooking at a blowing trash bag, that's a natural horse reaction. But an abnormal tendency to bite or kick is not normal. So you have to be really aware of that. Now, I just want to finish up with some food for thought because this will be another presentation down the road, I'm sure. Health issues. All of you guys have heard all the stories about most recently they just lifted a ban of horse movement in Delaware because of the um, outbreak of neurological EHV or equine herpes virus. There were cases in Maryland, Florida, California, University of Finley, their riding barn, they lost 19 horses 2003. About a year ago, Yukon had an outbreak in their polo ponies. UVM doesn't have EHV. But you know what? Our cows next door have some salmonella issues. So suddenly we are on basically a biosecurity lockdown because we want to make sure that we don't have our horses getting, having transferred salmonella from the, the cows while they're dealing with that. So that means that we have students that work with both horses and cows now they have to shower and change all clothes and everything else before they go to the horse barn from the cows. We have foot baths. I'll just click in here. Um, the cows are being quarantined as they're showing signs and they're trying to getting this under control. But the fact is salmonella can affect the horses, the cows and people. And it is an oral fecal transmission. And so you say oral mouth fecal poop. Well, don't eat that burger without washing your hands <laughs> and don't pick up, you know, you have to do a lot of biosecurity both with the horse and the people and your habits. So what about if you have a sick horse? Okay, yeah, somebody said they had salmonella in the previous barn 20 years ago and you cannot be too careful. Several vet schools have had salmonella outbreaks because they didn't realize the horse had it and people were going from stall to stall. Well, if you have a sick horse, you need to quarantine and that could be a new horse that you don't know is sick or healthy and or a horse that comes up sick. You need to not share equipment, not share footwear or clothes, always treat the horse, the sick horse last, go healthy to sick and then disinfect clothing, footwear, etc. So that one, like I said, I'm sure will be another talk because there are a lot of um, resources available and you can see these, the self-guided horse facility analysis is something, there's an article in the Journal of Extension, that's Joe, J-O-E, it looks like the slide cut off the bottom, <clears throat> um, that you can read about some of these things. And also we did some biosecurity stuff that is certainly now being put to practice in our facility right now. And I'm talking about the last week. Uh, salmonella, one of the first symptoms you will see is an elevated temperature. 
and then often you see a diarrhea or a colitis as well. And so anything associated with dehydration, um, off feed, not comfortable, potential colic, but often it starts with a fever. So our horses are getting their temperatures taken twice a day just to look for that spike in a fever to catch something quickly. So that gives you a start and gives you some eyes to look as far as your own facilities, what you can change, whether it's the facility or the behavior, and look further in and prevent accidents. So I'd take any other questions, if there's any. Thank you. And Greta, of course, is over by the door. So <laughs> see if I can get her to bark for you guys again to say goodbye. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm glad that we had so many people involved. No questions for us? I'd be happy to try and hit some questions. <laughs> Greta says goodbye too. <laughs> uh, we're still here if you have, if anybody has some questions. Come here, Greta. Uh, any recommendations for barn design consultants? Okay, so there's a, a couple of different good barn design books, but if you take a look that um, I've worked actually with Michigan State, Chris Skelly, um, with some stuff with our self-guided horse facility analysis. It's more like a question asking type of situation. And that will definitely make you think about, okay, do I need to do this? How, is this proper? Or how can I plan for or around this? Um, as far as manure management, that's a whole nother topic. And we have some great, um, yeah, the, the booklet is like a planning checklist. So if you answer yes, if it fits, um, then it works. If you look at that Joe Journal of Extension article, it'll tell you about that little booklet that we put together. And I know Michigan State has a, a facility analysis thing on their extension site that I'm sure that they can give you the website for that utilized. We worked together and used my booklet and some barn pictures and stuff from there. Uh, more info? That would be a Kate question, I think. I know that you have these. Oh, there you go. Good manure management. Somebody put in, Kelly put in a web link. Also on the UVM Extension website page, there's a horse composting or composting guide for horse owners that's available on there for download. And that would be um, <clears throat> you know, a good resource if you have want to look into some composting. Fencing, most dangerous. It's at www.uvm.edu and click on extension and somewhere on there they just redid the website, find publications. And fencing, most dangerous, you're going to say barbed wire. Usually you can see a horse that's barbed wire trained because they have the scars to prove it. Um, you could put rubber fencing on and the horse will probably grab a piece and eat it and colic. <laughs> so horses can find ways to hurt themselves in amazing ways. But any way that keeps the horse in without um, something that they can catch themselves on is going to be a, de a reasonable um, fencing for you. And there's also on the website um, UVM, let's see, um, if you go to the animal science website at the University of Vermont, there's an equine law area that gives livestock regulations, livestock laws, fencing laws, things like that. And let me see if I can type that in here. Yeah, there's no www. It's asci.uvm.edu slash equine and look for the UVM hosts equine law site. It's got some great resources for listed by the states. What to do if there's no air at all? Then definitely need to install some sort of air movement system, whether it's some fans, exhaust fans, or or otherwise. 
you're in Saudi Arabia, you certainly you probably are using something with like they do in the our west out here where you have um, misting to cool the animals and also air movement. I have a friend that was a dairy is a dairy nutritionist that was working in Saudi Arabia around Riyadh and so he said that they do a lot of cooling of their animals. I probably will be doing some more of these seminars on other subjects. I guess we'll see. <laughs> I guess I got the big smiley. I will be invited back. <laughs> ah, 24-hour email notice. Uh, we have horses, and as far as blanketing, we have horses that get fat and fuzzy, and we have horses, the students' horses, that have 73 different blankets for each temperature change by 5 degrees. And if you're using the horses quite a bit, then I would say we definitely would need to blanket and do even a little bit of a trace clip because they'll get hot and wet. and and that's not going to be comfortable for them. And Michelle says, let your horse be a horse, and that's absolutely right, as long as it works. If, if we were to not do blanketing, they'd get heated up, and they would definitely not be able to cool down and could get chilled. So in our case, we do some blanketing, uh, not as much as the students do on their horses in our barn. And just in case you guys missed ASI, which is animalscience.uvm.edu slash equine, and then click on equine law. I think it's on the right links. And that'll give you some great resources that you can actually look at your state's regulations for livestock laws and ship shipping requirements and equine activity statutes and things like that. Well, I thank you very much for having me on here. It's been quite enjoyable. I hope you learn something and you'll go with new fresh eyes to your, back to your own facilities. Thank you, Dr. Green. If you have any questions, um, you can forward them to info at myhorseuniversity.com. And also, this presentation was recorded, so you can also view that at myhorseuniversity.com as well. Thank you all for attending, and we hope you enjoyed the presentation.